All right, well, thank you so much for joining. Um, with me, I've got uh, several folks, uh, so let me introduce them. I'm going to butcher their names. I tried several times before this, so really hard. Um, Sander van der Vecht, who's uh, head of Media Monk Labs, uh, and uh, they are part of our Google Assistant Builders program, so he'll talk about that. Um, Nick Newenhouse, yes, <laughs> who's a CEO of Code Dezor. Uh, an agency that's working with multiple brands to build actions again on the Google Assistant. One example of their work is the KLM Pack Assistant. Um, we have the wonderful Abby Klassen, who's president of 360i North America. Um, they have developed several actions as well, so Bravo Tango and Jameson Barr, um, and recently released a research report and guide to voice called The Voice Playbook, which I really enjoyed reading. Um, and we've got Rob Bennett. Easiest name in the crew, uh, who's the CEO of Rehab. Uh, they have launched quite a few actions for the Google Assistant, including Safari Mixer, which I think you can try here, right? Yeah, in one of the booths. Uh, Nike, Estee Lauder, uh, and who's been recently awarded an Emmy, actually, for the chatbot Aiden with HBO on Westworld. So thank you for joining us. Um, so the first question for the group, uh, hopefully we can hear from everyone, is really uh, we'd love to hear from you guys about what action you've built for the Google Assistant, including maybe why you've chosen uh, to build this ex specific experience and, and what you found. Well, it's a bit of an, uh, a, a sad answer, but we can't really say because we're under so many NDAs. Um, we build actions for uh, big coffee chains, for instance, that, that, that much I can say. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of research that we do, especially from MediaMonks Labs. Um, we're always looking for new ways to, uh, to, to make use of it, so there's, there's plenty of experience there. Yeah, um, we've built the uh, KLM, KLM Pack Assistant, which is the first voice-driven smart pack assistant. We, uh, we all know the stress when you're packing your bags, and based on the duration, uh, amount of days, and the things you need to, uh, the essentials need, you need to bring, we kind of help the people at home via the assistant to, um, to help pack their bags. It's all contextual, so it connects to the passenger information, uh, the destination, and uh, it was fun to build, yeah. Very cool. We built a couple, as you mentioned, uh, Lillian. Um, the Jameson Barr uh, action was basically created based on the insight that people um, often search for Irish toasts around you know, celebrations like anniversaries, that sort of thing, or weddings or holidays. And so this is um, an action that essentially um, is a lot of fun, but it also sort of plays to the brands, uh, you know, it's very authentic to the brand and, and it's got a little bit of personality, so that's fun. Um, and then the second one is the Bravo Tango Brain Training, which is something we did for National Geographic Channel uh, for their veteran series called The Long Road Home. And um, this was a way for, uh, it, it's, it's basically a voice activated meditation um, a tool for veterans who are dealing with the stress of coming back from combat. And uh, that was, um, uh, it was a way for National Geographic Channel to essentially extend the ethos of the series and, and do something. It was actually created by veterans, our head of our innovation lab as a veteran, um, for veterans. Um, yeah, so we, uh, two of our biggest, uh, uh, the work we did for Nike um, and are doing for Nike at the moment. So that's called the Nike Coach. And um, we're not focused on campaign type actions. We, we're, we're more focused on um, creating a service or an ongoing reason to keep engaging with, a, with, a, with an action. So the Nike Coach is all around running and helping people to get into running. Um, and it then links into the wider Nike ecosystem. Um, it's about to get a a new update, it's kind of exciting. There's a lot of stuff that, that Nike are pushing in that direction. So they're, they're a pretty exciting brand to work with in this space. They're very forward thinking. And also Estee Lauder, um, instead of looking at what you'd imagine, which is trying to sort of sell products, um, they've taken a step above that and they're really focused on how to provide this utility of good skincare. So an assistant in the home that supports with all your needs around, around skincare, around nighttime routines. Um, and that's kind of the space that we're seeing third-party assistants trying to, trying to play a role in, that sort of utility space. Very cool. Well, thank you, guys. Um, so one thing that we recently announced on the Google Assistant, um, and I don't know if everybody thinks about this, but because it's voice, you know, we have noticed that uh, some segments of the population are starting to have an emotional connection. And actually, so an interesting stat we shared was just in the last month, for example, we've seen one million people say the term, I love you, to the Google Assistant, which is just kind of an interesting thing. 
And I'm curious if you're seeing kind of a similar type of like human connection that people are starting to have with these apps, because they're quite different than a regular website or a mobile app. Um, and so, uh, you know, first I think for Abby, I'm curious to hear, especially from you, um, how you're, you're seeing users connecting with your action. Sure. You know, I think, um, I mean, there's very few things that are more personal to somebody than their mental health, right? And uh, one of the, the insights that drove our creating this particular uh, solution for National Geographic Channel, you know, we didn't go out and say, oh, we need to create some sort of a voice action for them. We went out to say, okay, um, veterans come home from combat, and a lot of them are struggling with the stresses of reintegration and dealing with what they saw on the battlefield. And yet, so many people are so uncomfortable talking about mental health, and there are things that people don't even feel comfortable, you know, talking about to their friends and to their family, but they will ask Google these things. And so that was the essentially the insight that led to creating this action and you know we weren't quite sure exactly how that sort of in interest and in, or, or openness to asking Google would translate to voice we had this hypothesis that it would and what we've seen is pretty incredible so um, over 6,000 use cases a month and um, six to 11 minutes per session which is which means they're going through multiple exercises so you know a very personal kind of use for voice um, yeah, we, we did um, some research with Google and Este to look into um, the next phase of work that we're going to develop out. And we, we identified that, that people have strong um, sort of personal connections with assistants. Um, so when it came to thinking about the attributes, people tend to anthropomorphize things. You know, we say the weather's evil or, you know, the earthquake's evil. Like, we, we tend to do that. And with assistants, humans, you know, uh, tend to want to do the same thing. And you see that with, like, the different different uh, sort of the voice tones and stuff like that already within these experiences across all the different voice services. Um, but our results showed that 66% of people preferred to have some sort of human name and it have human characteristics than be a, a pure play brand, um, a brand experience, which for us was pretty interesting because it showed that there's a whole load of personality we should be building out around how people interact with, with these experiences. Mm -hmm. What about for you, Nick or Sander? Um, you know, are you seeing any sort of emotional connection with the apps you're building? Yeah, it, uh, it actually connects quite well. We see um, a big emotional connection with uh, children specifically, and that's because they simply don't understand how input is translated into function in any uh, digital environment. So what we're seeing right now is as soon as they talk, they expect an opinion back rather than just a function. And um, an opinion can be anything, so they connect the personality to it and they'd like to understand the personality before interacting with it. And I'm just really interested to see if this generation grows up and becomes familiar with using voice, where that's going to end up. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, <clears throat> just like Abby said, we also found out that um, people have a more intimate relationship with their voice assistants um, because of its ab ability to actually uh, trigger an emotional response. Um, so in terms of what mentioned before, char characteristics and, and tone of voice is really, really important and a great opportunity for brands to define those to actually generate a stronger relationship uh, with their customers. So it, that's actually what we use to define uh, the tone of voice for KLM Pack Assistant. They have a really uh, defined tone of voice in terms of how their customer support works, uh, dealing with, with questions and, and support for people. So actually use that in terms of, and define the, 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 the brand voice uh, as well, in terms of friendly, personal, of, um, professional, uh, but also a bit cheeky uh, to trigger that emotional uh, response. Great. Um, so one other thing we recently announced with the Google Assistant is that uh, we plan to go to 30 languages and 80 markets by the end of 2018. And so um, I'm curious, you know, maybe for Sander, uh, as the Google Assistant expands into new markets and languages, you know, we see many opportunities. I know you and I talked about kind of the laws that are changing and, and what you're seeing. Yeah, I, I just uh, recently moved to Stockholm and um, the Swedes being famous for safety, I was kind of... Uh, intrigued by the fact that they're still allowed to call on the phone while driving and um, that's a law that's going to change quite soon and, and people are upset about it because they can't use their phone anymore 
and, and they rely on their car because distances are, are greater. And one of the things that they're looking for is a solution for that, which is voice, of course. So uh, for, th for them, it's a super interesting uh, way to, uh, yeah, to make use of all the things that they're used to, to, to working with, uh, but behind the wheel. Mm -hmm. What about for Rob? Um, what do you see as potential new target uh, opportunities? So I think the, the flexibility that it offers global brands um, to be able to move into new markets, because you've built the logic base generally for the service or utility that you're going to create for people. And then, then it's pretty quick to then expand that out, um, which for brands like Nike, SA Lauder, Moe Hennessy that we work with, that's super interesting, especially the growth that assistance getting in Asia. That's a massive market that um, is really, really important for, right. for these brands right now. Great. Um, and for Nick, you, know, you mentioned the KLM action. I'm curious if you saw anything interesting. Yeah, so it's as KLM being a global player, it's really interesting to uh, explore new markets as well. They do customer support in nine languages. So, uh, yeah, we're definitely looking into um, porting it to those markets and languages as well. But I think in general, um, I'm really excited about, for instance, uh, opening up new services and possibilities for people who are illiterate. In, in, for instance, in a market like India, which is really interesting, what voice can, can be and what added value it can be to open up services for those people. Right. Cool. Um, so switching gears, um, I've been using the term the voice revolution really recently um, as a way to describe how users are kind of connecting with these voice experiences. Um, on the Google Assistant product team, we really talk about three particular daily journeys that we want to attach the assistant to. So that's like, you know, getting ready in the morning. You mentioned driving, definitely when people are on the go. And then like helping them relax in the evening. These are kind of our critical user journeys that we help drive the product. Um, and I was mentioning to you guys, you know, I had an aha moment as I was looking at the data and the research around, you know, how voice is perfect for some of these like hands-free type of situations. And so for everyone really, I'm just curious to hear your perspective on, you know, is that making you think about new things as you think, you know, about how, how users are interacting with voice? Well, I think it's um, I think it's smart to think about voice and where it falls in sort of the journey because you know we don't we don't really set out to create like okay we're going to do a voice action or, or app or skill or whatever it's it's really about like solving what is the challenge what is the what is the place where it can provide utility or entertainment or something of value to people um, and I think anywhere that uh, there is anywhere there's sort of an opportunity for sort of ambient computing is a place that voice can play. So that's one of the things that we're looking at, um, along with sort of the consumer need, you know, which, I mean, the examples of, say, a Bravo Tango, it's, it, is, it is truly like it was a consumer insight that led to the creation of it. So that's where we see the most opportunity. Right. Um, yeah, I think, I think we think of it as, obviously, we're thinking of these things as voice because that's what all the media is talking about at the moment and all the hype and the news, and it's like voice and home speakers and the rapid growth of home speakers. But I think it's really going to come alive with um, when you consider the, like you said, the wider ecosystem, but specifically like visual accompaniment to the voice experience. So surface switching was like a major thing that when you guys released that, that opened up a whole load of new things that you can do as a user. Um, being able to talk to an assistant speaker in your home and then get a message come through to your phone to carry on the experience visually, because sometimes you need to do that. Um, the assistant being available on TV, being available in car. I think it's how visual stuff happens with voice will um, accelerate how people uh, sort of interact and it will create new, new things that we can come up with that, that sort of and new solves for people. Yeah, I think the, the word assistant um, gives a promise of uh, something or somebody helping you out. And um, that's, um, that's something that you have to design the, the app for. It's not only um, pushing buttons using voice, it's a, a different way of thinking in order to get the most out of it. So um, yeah, the, the way it can help you out is, uh, is, is crucial in, in this case. And the persona behind it, like who are you talking with, does it have certain intelligence response in order to, to really help you out rather than just execute a task? Um, yeah, th that's something that, that if you ever create an action, is something you need to take into account. It's, um, and that's where, the, where the, the difference is going to be. Yeah, totally agree. And I think it's also interesting to, to take a good look at how people behave in different contextual situations, like being in a car or at home, on the run, public transport, 
what the role of voice is and how you how you deal with that in terms of response and in terms of conversation. It's really interesting to dive into that and mm -hmm. and uh, I look at that. Very cool. So Abby, we were just recently talking. You published this uh, report on a guide to voice, um, and I'm curious if you can share any trends or insights and and if you had yourself like an aha moment about the usage of voice. Well, so. The aha moment that made a lot of waves was um, sort of in preparation for the voice playbook, but, but also sort of independently. We launched something called Voice Search Monitor. And basically, we got to wondering, why do certain, when you, when you ask a voice assistant a question, why does it answer you know, one way versus another way? Or why does it cite one source versus another source? And you know, our brands, our clients are wondering that as well. It's sort of like the early days of search when you would, you know, you'd, you'd type something into Google and you know, it would spit out a result and maybe it was your competitor instead of you. And you're like, how the heck are they there? And where am I, you know? Um, and so uh, we launched this thing called Voice Search Monitor. And basically we put together a system where we ask, um, uh, we, we ask each of the voice platforms like tens of thousands of questions you know, every month um, in different categories. And then we catalog what their responses are and you know, where are they pulling the information from. And then we use, and then we sort of, you know, that's where the sort of strategic layer comes in and we look at you know, what can we learn from that. And um, so one of the interesting things that we found was um, that Google Assistant knows the most out of all the voice uh, voice assistants um, by a lot. I didn't pay her to say that. No, but. she didn't. Uh, I can vouch for that. Although I might have a free smoothie from you guys afterwards, but um, but knows like six times more than um, Amazon. Now, both platforms, all the platforms, are getting smarter all the time, and obviously it makes sense. Google has a huge knowledge graph to pull from. But one of the things that we've been able to do through that um, is make very simple kind of like uh, seeming like SEO style uh, improvements in our clients' content and the indexing of the content in order to have those answers show up um, basically like they would show up in the in the Google knowledge box because that's sort of the, the voices pulling from those places. And um, but unlike you know a visual search, voice gives you one answer. So it's incredibly important for it to be there. So so that was one of the the insights was just not not only how much Google knows, but then also how do we sort of improve our client's content so that it is the answer that is delivered. Amazing. Um, so maybe I know we have a couple, only a couple minutes left. I'm curious to hear from each of you. You know, what is a lesson that you learned in the process of building these actions that maybe for these folks that you wish you would have known before you had built it that you want to share? Well, it is very easy to think about voice as another way of of input, um, like I mentioned before. And um, what I see with agencies and people that we work with is. Um, they're looking for ways to, uh, to, to use what they already have, either a website or an app, and then add voice functionality to it. And that's a bit of a shame because there's so much more that you can do with it. It's more than just pushing a button. So one of the things that I learned that was really helpful for me was the, the idea of the personas. So if you have a brand uh, and you would um, embody it as a certain person, what would he or she look like and what would he or she say so we're doing these little uh, games uh, in our office where we sit across each other from the table and one is a brand and the other one is a user. And we start a conversation just to see what happens. And it helps us a lot in, in defining what kind of uh, action we, we need to make, what persona we need to create. Yeah, I think what we've learned is, is, is in terms of voice design, um, um, to prototype fast because you can Redefine all the conversations and possible answers, and and it helped us a lot to to iterate faster and move faster, and uh, in, instead of designing and everything beforehand, um, but go fast into a prototype phase to actually test things in terms of a conversation. Because sometimes you think you can give all the answers you know, but sometimes people do something else, and I mean it, it helps a lot. Um, I love the point about the tone of voice because I think that's really important and we've talked to a lot of our clients about um, if you're having a really hard time figuring out your tone of voice in voice, it probably means your brand's tone of voice isn't very strong overall. So that's um, just sort of like the basics, getting it right. And so we've, we've done a lot of work with that, um, like the Jameson app 
is age gated. And if you ask in a, if you're under 21, it'll serve you a Shirley cocktail recipe. So just like little things that capture kind of the essence of what the brand is about. Um, I guess they're, they're kind of like the key things, personality and working out the tone of voice. I think that's super important. But for brands looking to get into this space, the thing that is, is really, I think, important to think about is it, this isn't a PR stunt. This isn't something that we feel is going to be the people who bought these home speakers or are using assistants are pretty smart and they're interested and they're inquisitive and they want to be stimulated and you need to f there's a, there's you know they're talking to to Google or other competitors and getting a good experience so if you're going to build something in this space you need to be at that level or better uh, and it's completely possible to do it but you need to think of it as stop thinking about post uh, sort of pre-purchase and think about it at how does it support post-purchase or how does it elevate the brand post-purchase instead of trying to like drive sales from a thing like this. I think it's it's the experience post that. And it's much, much from my experience, client side at Samsung, it's much cheaper to keep people who are loyal to your brand than trying to attract new ones. And this is a really massive way of creating that web in your existing ecosystem, I think. I think that's a really important point because if you're gonna build some sort of voice action or app or skill, build a good one. Like, don't build a crappy yes, one. And I think it's so easy for, for brands to just be like, I want one of those and just do whatever it takes to have one out there. And over time, I truly believe brands are going to be punished by putting bad, whether it's in the minds of consumers or even in, like, you know, what kinds of skills and, and, and actions the platforms actually recommend um, based on the quality score. Not unlike, by the way, search results right. are scored. Well, thank you so much. These are some of the brands, by the way, behind you that have built actions on Assistant. Um, thank you very much, you guys. I learned myself a lot. And thank you guys for listening. <laughs>